Urba 2000 looks at examples of urban achievements from which Canadian cities might benefit. The Urba 2000 series grew out of the French language series Urbanos, which probed a wide range of urban problems as manifested in Montreal. The cities presented here are only an example of urban planning which attempts to respond to human environmental values and needs. They were chosen following eight months of worldwide research on urban development. This film is an English version of the original French Urba 2000 series. The purpose of Runcorn is to uh, provide uh, better living conditions for mainly Liverpool people where the position is uh, rather desperate. And uh, this is a new town, eventually to have 100,000 population. It starts with the existing township of Runcorn of 27,000. And uh, the conception really is very simple. It is an endeavor to provide a balanced town in which the motor car has certain privileges, public transport has certain privileges, and people, perhaps most of all, have the privilege of walking about in safety from their homes to their, as far as the children are concerned, to their schools, and the parents to their social facilities, to the shopping center, and so on. I think if you approach Runcorn by car, you feel that the town is yours and you can get anywhere in the town up to a certain point where the places where people live. But if you approach by bus, you perhaps arrive at the city center and there you get on a bus, well, you feel that uh, the world is yours too because this bus has the right of way along special routes and the traffic lights are so arranged that uh, when they come to a crossing, the lights are in favor of the bus. And if you are on foot, uh, within the heart of the residential areas, you don't come across a car. You've got your special walkways. When you come across the uh, busway, um, you go over a bridge or un under a subway, so that uh, although all the facilities are there, none of them are in conflict. Of course, this is not just a technical theory. In the end, the test of a new town is whether people are satisfied. And I think it's true to say that the people have found the, this simple bus service, which is a figure of eight uh, in this way. They found this very convenient. Uh, the bus drivers, incidentally, have said that they feel that as though they were on holiday because they have no traffic in the way. They can go at 30, 40 miles an hour. And the... Uh, People, the passengers, complain that the journeys are too short. Uh, but of course, the principle is this, that the shopping city is at the center of the new town. This is virtually a very large air-conditioned box which is split up into areas for shopping, social and commercial uses and is elevated above the ground by approximately 20 feet. All of the shopping takes place at this upper level but storage and other uses such as cinemas, squash courts, entertainment, public houses can take place below this level. 
which is the level at which the ordinary vehicles service the centre. Pedestrians coming into the centre come into the corners from the valley side. They come along a horizontal footpath through the edge of the car park here and into the centre without having to go down or uphill. Likewise, the people on the busway come into the town centre on the busway here, get off the bus under cover and go down by escalator to the access level to the shopping. People who come on country buses come in at the ground level underneath that and come up to ground level here by escalator and also into the shopping centre. People coming to do their shopping trips by car come into, at present, the four multi-storey car parks sited in the four corners of the shopping area. This allows all people, whether walking on the bus or by car, to have easy, safe access into the centre, which is fully protected from the vagaries of the English weather. This is not only a commercial centre, but also a service centre. Could you show us where both are located? Yes, within the main shopping area here, there are some service uses. There are cinemas, there will be a dance hall and a social club. But in the northern loop of the road system here, we have commercial offices here, a police station, law courts, commercial offices here, and a public library there. And in a further phase of the shopping city to be built to the south, there will be other entertainment and commercial uses. and a series of residential communities are linked by a bus route which goes through the centres of those communities. And at each centre is a bus stop. The bus stop is at the local shopping centre. So there's a, a link uh, between the major shopping centre and the minor shopping centre. The schools are also located at the, near, at the centre points so that um, if you happen to go to a school in a different community, you can also go by bus. And everyone in each of these communities is within walking distance of their local shop and of the bus stop and of the school. In fact, there is a walking module that is the starting point of this town that facilities are planned within walking distance. When they're outside that distance, well, you have to go by public transport along the figure of eight route or you go by car if you wish but the principle of the car in its uh, in the way it's ar arranged within the structure is that it should be have its main movements outside the town it should there should be not no through traffic the roads are outside they have their feeders in to each community and in the middle is a town park. And the style of the architecture we have here is very largely dictated by the site. The centre of the, of the town, as you know, is this large rock with the ruins of the castle on it. And we very consciously made a decision that we would keep all of the buildings fairly low in relation to that. And also relate their colours and textures to the old sandstone colours of the, of the rock. Hence the housing that you see around here on Hawkenbrow 
is in a, a brown brick, precisely chosen to match in with the color of the old sandstone up here. Similarly, on other housing development, we've kept a very simple vocabulary of materials because we feel the most important aspects of this sort of development are the quality one can put into the landscaping and the importance of the people themselves. Is it not too expensive to care so much about architecture? Good architecture is a good investment. Do you think it pays off in the long run? Oh, indeed. I think the up-to-date, uh, about getting on for £100 million has been spent on Runcorn. Half of that money has come from private sources. If it wasn't good value, it, we wouldn't have got money from private sources. This is an adventure playground in which young people from all over the states are able to come and play during the day and especially at weekends. The group that you see walking down uh, on the bottom at present are the group from the local comprehensive school. They come sometimes during the week to help with the establishment of the adventure play area and also the young girls at the school come and help with the play group which is indoors at present. The idea behind it is that the young people are able to do what they please, when they want, under a very, very small supervisory staff. And the whole setup has been put forward by the Runcon Development Corporation so that young people can come away from the housing estates and let themselves go in an environment which is large enough for them to do so. This is Castlefield Community Centre, which has been built for the use of the whole of the community who live in Castlefield. It was first opened in 1971 uh, with a joint scheme by the Urban District Council, the Runcon Development Corporation and Cheshire County Council. It's the hub of the community development in this estate. And we have many groups who come in here every day and every evening for their activities. We look after groups from a very small age group, the play groups, we look after the groups who are the teenagers, and we also look after for the groups who are mature and also the old age pensioners. Today, there is an old age pensioners luncheon club in which all people who live in the area can come at this time of day for a meal, which is, doesn't cost them very much at all, and is as part of the community provision within the centre. We also have groups who meet in the evening for uh, music, drama, physical activity, keep fit, sewing groups, and also just a group of people who like to be together to, to discuss each other. And the place is open seven days a week and seven evenings a week. What do you think of this new town? It's a wonderful place to live in. I would sooner be here than anywhere else, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I do really think that it's one of the nicest areas I've ever lived in. And I've lived in a few. There's a lot to it, you know. It, the, the two towns, the old town and the new town, they get together and they forget that they're old town and new town. It will be something wonderful. I think um, more, more than anything else, all that people cater for now is emergency housing. They try and get people somewhere to live just as a matter of course, you know. There's no uh, thought of what they're, what they're leaving behind them when they move. 
and uh, I think most people, especially from Liverpool, miss this. They miss all the all the the background they've left behind, all the shopping even. You don't get the local shops here that you had in Liverpool, you know. And this is a big thing. They yeah, do miss it. Here they get fresh air and they get green areas. It's not much different, really, the air. I don't think it's uh, any fresher <laughs> with all the industry surrounding us, you know. What difference do you find between living in Liverpool and living in Runcorn? Oh, dear, the countryside, and the fresh air, shopping facilities, the house itself, everything. Completely different sort of name. Yes, but every small town offers the same advantages. In what way is Runcorn special? There's more, there's everything there's of everything convenience you could, here. you could need in one corner. You know. It's very convenient, we've got a decent bus service. There's every convenience for you everything up here. And it's nice for the children, you know. What are the reasons you moved here? I think more or less for the kids, you know. Clean mm. air and, you know, they've never ailed since they've been up here. They've never been sick, you know. No, they've been you sick. You know, they've been pretty good. You've got no danger roads or anything like that. You've got no worry at all, I don't think myself, really. Do you like run corn? Like run corn, yeah. What difference is there between life in Liverpool and life in run corn? Um, well, the big difference for us was for the children, because where we lived before, you know, they couldn't play out because of the traffic. And here, um, you know, they're fairly well protected from the cars. And, you know, they like being able to play out, obviously. Mrs. Armstrong, do you think people here have started acquiring a sense of community? Many people could lose this feeling as they feel much more lonely in the new towns than they did in Manchester or Glasgow. Um, no, I don't think so, really. I think um, they've got everything going for them, really. Whereas a person, say they moved from Scotland to Liverpool, um, they're a complete unknown, whereas here there's all sorts of organisations, different clubs and that. There's a play school, to, well, several play schools to take their children to. There's the ordinary schools, there's clinics, there's the community centres. Uh, they all hold various functions, don't they? Mm. And they've got every opportunity to mix and to make friends. I think friends. with everybody being new as well. You know, if you sort of just moved your family to a separate <coughs> town, you'd be the one new person and a stranger yes. to everybody, you know? Yes. Whereas I think the people coming here, everybody's new. I mean, we've only, we haven't been here a year ourselves yet. And I think, you know, I think I know more people since I moved here than I'd ever did in the 30 years I lived where I was before, you know. It's a sort of a chain reaction, it isn't is, it, really? Isn't it? You know. Mr. and Mrs. Hansen, where did you live before coming to Runcorn? Well, we lived in Liverpool, uh, an area called Norris Green, which um, was a council estate in Runcorn, in Liverpool, I should say. Um, it's totally different to this, very much smaller house. So we find this a great improvement. And house-wise, you know, we have four, four bedrooms here. We only have three. We have one living room and a dining room here. We only had a living room there. Why did you decide to live here? You got a new job or something? Um, no, I... Well, my job is near... I'm nearest my work here than I was there. But um, we decided to leave because we, ha we were offered a bigger house. Um, well, the area is much nicer. And the area we lived in wasn't too nice. It was uh, rather a lot of vandalism. Then we decided to get out of it. And um, this was the choice. Well, this was one of the choices. This is the one we preferred. There's one car, so uh, hence we're here. Did your wife agree to your decision? Oh, yes. Yes, very much so. Um, the area we originally lived in was nice, but then as the years went on, it deteriorated. And we thought the time was ripe for a move, and this seemed to be the best place to move to. We had no regrets. No, no, no regrets at all. How does she like the change from Liverpool? Um, not now. At first, they were just changed. Obviously, they lost their friends. Uh, they moved, changed the schools, which didn't help them much. But um, they said, we've been here 10 months. They've settled, made new friends. And um, I think the environment here is much better for them. There's plenty of fields and woods, and uh, we're handy for. Yeah, big forest, um, Delamere Forest. We can take them up there in 10 minutes. And my car, and um, well, it's much healthier. It's a much healthier aspect here. Is the rent more expensive here than in Liverpool? Yes. The rent is very much more expensive, <laughs> but it's worth it. You know, it is worth it. If, if you can afford it, it's worth it. 
because you get so much more for it. And you can be subsidised? You can be, yes, yes, you, you can be. Um, we aren't, as it happens, but you can be. Um, and this is also a, a help to anybody moving from there. The rents are fairly high, but as you say, um, depending on what you earn, if you're on a low, low income, well, it will subsidise your rent for you. Can you find all the social services here, as you did in Liverpool before? Um, well, not quite the, so the social services, yes. Um, social life is a little less, but I think that will improve in time once the estate is expanded and finished. And Liverpool isn't too far away, is it? No. You're with no. a car, no. half an hour. 30 minutes, and you can be in Liverpool. Is Runcorn faced with many problems like delinquency, mugging, or vandalism? Well, there's a lot of vandalism. Um, the youth clubs that they have here are only just starting, and I don't think a lot of young people have realised what they can do at these youth clubs. A lot of these kids that live in these areas now have come from the streets of Liverpool, um, they're used to hanging around on corner streets, they're used to going out and seeing what trouble they can find, um, and they still do it here. Whether it's a new place or an old place, they're still going to do the same thing until somebody shows them a better way. Then it's only a matter of time for them to get used to living here in Runcorn. Yeah. Um, I was in England once before. I lived in London for two months, and then I moved to the south coast. But while I was in London, I worked at a youth club in the East End of London. And I know what it's like, these kids that have come here, because they don't know any different. They, they've never had anything that's good. They've never had anything to take care of. Um, they've had no sense of responsibility. They're just out to do what damage they can. Once you have developed the land into residential or industrial areas, do you sell it back or do you keep it? On industrial sites, we keep the freehold of the land and lease sites or rent factories to the, to the clients. The corporation build standard nursery factories for small industries coming into the town, but also lease sites to the larger industrialists for the, the special plants, such as this aluminium extrusion plant and a furniture making factory shortly to be constructed here. For residential development, we either rent the houses to the occupants, houses that we built ourselves, or we sell the freehold of the land to builders to build houses for sale. When one walks or travels through Runcorn, one gets the impression it's a very industrial city surrounded by factories. Don't you think the residential and industrial districts are too close together? I don't think the new industrial areas are too close to the new housing areas. The closest we have is the situation of Aspmore and Runcorn here where they are separated by a canal and an expressway because all of the new industries coming into Runcorn are in fact clean industries they're not the old chemical industries which are sited in the older part of the town below the hill over here. Is this new town trying to reach a minimum goal of one job per family? No, 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 I think you have to recognize in Runcorn that it is a new town within a region. It's the part of the Merseyside and you could hardly separate uh, Merseyside from the Manchester uh, conurbation. I mean, it, what it comes to is that you can never stop people traveling a reasonable distance to their work. And it would be unrealistic in Runcorn to say that it should be completely self-contained so far as employment was concerned. Even if you started off in that way, you couldn't guarantee it for the future because it, the parents might work or the father might work in a factory, but the children um, can't be controlled, not even by their parents, as to where they will work. If they find a new job and it's well paid, they'll go off to Liverpool, back to Liverpool, if they, even if they've come from Liverpool, or across the Mersey to Widnes. So in the main, um, of course, uh, it's sensible if people don't have very far to travel to work. And uh, I would imagine, we estimated in the plan that there would be something like 30% or 33 of a third percent of the people um, employed outside, that is the employed um, force. Um, I believe actually it's slightly more than that at the moment. And um, I don't see anything wrong in this. I think it's uh, healthy that uh, Runcorn should play its part in the general mixture of industry 
um, in this region. Mr. Amos, as a city planning officer of Liverpool and a former president of the Town Planning Institute of England, do you really think this is the way to solve the slum district problems in Liverpool? Well, I think that uh, it has been a good thing to have Runcorn uh, in Merseyside because if we look at the uh, improvements which it has given to the population as a whole, there are many people living in much better conditions now than if the new town had not been built. But the difficulty which I see occurring in a new town is that it tends to separate out the very good from the very bad that most of the benefits are concentrated in the new town and many of the problems are left behind in the old area. And our administration of uh, old cities has not been as efficient in dealing with uh, problems as the administration of the new towns. But why choose Runcorn? Why not renew the slum districts in downtown Manchester or Liverpool? Runcorn doesn't seem to solve the real problems. This new town concept seems to me like a utopia, maybe. Well, you present uh, these propositions to me as alternatives, but new towns are not alternatives to reconstruction, rehabilitation of slum areas in the big cities. They are an essential part of what you might call a combined operation. Uh, you uh, release the pressure in the big cities, in Manchester and Liverpool, by taking people out to new towns. And when you've, released, when you've uh, relieved the pressure, uh, then you, you can ha have the opportunity with less people there uh, and in particular if you can arrange for it to coincide with a particular area you can have the opportunity of redevelopment, rehabilitation and so the new town helps the old. This is the purpose of the exercise. Doesn't Runcorn take the best industries and jobs from Liverpool and leave the worst with the low-income people in Liverpool? Yes, it does. Uh, it, uh, this is our problem, and uh, I think if you look at any of the major cities in Britain, you'll find that the inner parts of the old conurbations have a large proportion of people with not very good jobs or no jobs at all, quite a lot of old people, quite a lot of people who are sick or disabled in one way or another. And uh, the concentration has come about because we have moved out the more enterprising and the more resourceful and the more hard-working uh, members of the population into the new towns. But you do have to remember, I think, that if we hadn't created the new towns, then some of those jobs which are now in the area would never have come into the northwest of England at all. And so we would have been without that economic opportunity. Professor Peter Hall, what is the origin of the new town concept in England? The real origin of new towns in England is a book uh, by a man called Ebenezer Howard, published in the year 1898, and now known uh, under the title Garden Cities of Tomorrow. Uh, Howard first uh, put forward the idea that um, the population of big cities should be decentralized into new communities, he called them garden cities, in the countryside. Uh, and the jobs would be taken out as well as the people, so there would be no need for long-distance commuting back into the cities. Howard said that in this way you could provide uh, all the advantages of living in a town with all the advantages of living in uh, the country, hence the name Garden City. And he advocated uh, grouping garden cities in clusters so as to make what he called uh, social cities. That was new planned urban agglomerations. Uh, the idea didn't catch on for a very long time, but of course after World War II it did in Britain in a rather big way. Many people think of these projects as utopias, saying that one can't be in the country and in town at the same time. Well, Howard uh, very specifically said that he wasn't utopian. He was against uh, utopian ideas. Uh, he said his idea was very practical, and in fact most of the book is full of hard facts about how you would actually build a town and how you would pay for it. Um, in fact, I, I think Howard was right that by uh, creating rather small communities uh, and, and putting uh, green belts around them, uh, you could perform the trick of having people live in a town but also appearing to live in the country at the same time. The essence was that you'd have small towns but built in clusters so that no one would be very far from the open countryside, but all of them would have access to a very large range of jobs and a very large range of urban services.
So now in England, how is a site chosen to build a new town or a city singled out to become an expanding town? Well, broadly, the new towns in Britain fall into two groups. Uh, one group is to provide for Howard's original idea uh, of decentralizing people from the big urban agglomerations. So we have uh, uh, over 10 new towns for London. In fact, there are now 11 of them. Uh, we have uh, new towns for Birmingham, new towns for Manchester, new towns for Liverpool, new towns for Glasgow. But we also have a group of new towns which are solely intended to promote regional development in parts of the country which are not uh, performing as well economically as the rest of the country. Some of those al also serve the purpose of overspill from the agglomerations in those parts of the country. Most of the new towns are in fact uh, providing for Howard's original purpose of urban overspill. And what's the difference between new towns and expanding towns? Um, there is a technical difference between new towns, uh, as we call them, and expanding towns. Uh, but it isn't a very real difference if you see these towns on the ground. The difference is that new towns are, build, are built by what we call development corporations. These are more or less autonomous corporations which get their money directly from the uh, treasury of the central government and are largely independent of the local government in the area. The expanding towns, on the other hand, are built by agreement between the local government in the area, generally a borough, uh, and the uh, exporting authority in the big agglomeration. So they, are, they result from agreement between two or sometimes three local authorities to build the town. And they share the financial burden, but they get some of the money back from the central government. Dennis. But in practice, the, uh, 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 an expanding town often looks exactly like a new town. Do you think in an expanding town one can expect the same socio-cultural life as in older cities? Um, I think uh, you can manage to get the same um, cultural life uh, that you get in an old town uh, over time. But it's going to take a very long time. After all, um, the uh, working class culture in the old towns of Britain was a very distinctive one. Um, the uh, worker went to the football match on a Saturday afternoon to support his own team. He afterwards went to the pub and maybe spent the whole of Saturday night there. There was a pub on every street corner. Now, it's very difficult to reproduce this in a new town even if you wanted to. The result is that the uh, workers in Cumbernauld, in Scotland for instance, will go back to Glasgow to uh, support their football team on a Saturday afternoon and then they may stay in the Glasgow pubs because there aren't so many pubs in Cumbernauld and maybe they just don't have the same character. Maybe it's impossible ever to, to recreate the, that character. And to some extent, the new towns may create a different pattern of social life altogether. Don't you think it's just a matter of time? Maybe 20 years from now, they'll have their own team. I think in, in time, the new towns will go to a size where they have their own football team. But by that time, I think the pattern of working class life will have changed. You just cannot reproduce that old crowded, intense pattern of working class life, which was after all partly a function of slum living. Would you say that in America or Canada, for instance, the new town policy could succeed without decentralization of industry? I think the new town idea as we understand it, it depends on decentralizing jobs from the big cities as well as homes. A new town to us is not a new town if virtually all the workers have to commute back into the city to find jobs. Now, we're less rigid about this than we were 20 years ago. Uh, we now think that it doesn't matter so much if some people commute, but we want to provide at any rate the chance for people who, who, who like to work locally to be able to work locally. That's central to our concept. But on the other hand, it has to remember be remembered that we're not decentralizing jobs very far. Uh, the new towns we're building are 30, 40, well perhaps now sometimes as far as 70 miles from the centers of our big cities. But given uh, the scale of North American urban development, that's not a very long way from the city center. It's quite feasible, I should have thought, for industry in North America and offices also to move that far away from the cities without really suffering any loss. <laughs>